bless you. You can be seated. Well, it's always good to be back in this house, and thank you. Love you too. You know, one of the reasons why I love this church so much is because they do a lot of outreach. And I believe that we're not called to inreach, we're called to outreach. I don't think a church just needs to sit around and talk about nothing but their own church growth. If you reach out to hurting people, your church will grow. And we partner together a lot. They partner with us in our, we call it our Hand of Hope Missions Outreach. And uh, actually our son, David, David, you and Shelly stand up. Let them see how cute you are. He's our oldest son. And uh, they actually head up the mission's hand of hope and they work really hard and go all over the world. And then my husband, Dave, of course, who I've been married to 55 years. You know, Dave and I are getting a little bit older now, and so the, the most frequent word spoken in our house now is, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I said the other day, let's agree that we're not going to try to talk to each other unless we're in the same room, <laughs> because it doesn't work. But I want to tell you a funny story about Dave. His hearing is much worse than mine. Now, he won't tell you that, but it is. I'm real good in my right ear. My left ear is a little bit gone. Not gone, but about half gone. And uh, uh, so I was, we were in the car, close distance, and I was telling Dave about this minister who, in New York, who had been found to be having many affairs. And Dave got this really strange look on his face. You know the look that people get when you can tell that they don't know what you said? And so I'm already thinking this is going to be good. And he says to me, why does he need so many bears in New York? <laughs> so actually, we have a lot of fun just because we can't always hear each other. Two quick things. Dave has actually written a book. Amen. Dave wrote a book. You know, he has a great passion for our nation, and this is called Freedom is Costly but Priceless. If not maintained, it will not remain. And um, you'll find out a lot of good things in here that our history has been revised, and a lot of the history that you hear about is not even true now. You'll find out what socialism really is and hopefully make a decision you absolutely do not want it. You'll find out why our education system has declined so much. You'll find out what your part is in restoring America. So we didn't bring any resources with us, but you can get this from us. You can get it online. You can get it in bookstores everywhere. And my latest book released in January is called The Power of Thank You. Now, I know you all think you're thankful. So you don't need that book because you're already thankful. But I would just ask you to consider how much you complain before you decide that you're thankful enough. <laughs> Actually, the other day, I found something really wonderful about this being thankful thing. I was kind of having a morning where, you know, you wake up some mornings and you really don't have anything to be unhappy about, but you just don't feel real great and you can kind of feel yourself kind of going like mm -hmm. And I've actually found out that when that happens, if I will start aggressively thanking God, it pulls me right out of it. And so get that book too. Now, that's all. I want to talk to you tonight about the power of restraint which is actually self-control. But I thought I'd put a nice new name on it just to make it a little more inviting. If 
Father, I thank you for the word tonight, and I pray that people will hear what you want them to hear. I know I've got more to say than I have time, so bring out of me what you want to bring out and help people give them a spirit of understanding tonight to really understand the importance of this message and to hear what each one needs to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the foundation scripture that I want to use is James 4, 7 which says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Now, a lot of people quote only the back half of that scripture. I did it myself for a lot of years. Resist the devil and he will flee. But he won't if you don't submit yourself to God. So, We get mad at the devil because of all the things that he does to aggravate us and we talk about spiritual warfare and we should resist the enemy. The Bible actually says in 1 Peter, resist the devil at his onset. The minute that you sense the enemy coming against you, you don't wait to see what he's going to do. You resist him right away. But obedience to God, total, complete obedience to God is still in the Bible, and it's still a very important subject. Not one that people get real excited about, but one that they have to hear. It's, it's sad, a little amusing, but more sad. We have podcasts on little, not podcasts, Instagram posts. I forget what all that stuff's called. And uh, they're little one minute things out of my sermons and uh, the media people put names on them. Sometimes I think, well, I don't know why you named it that, but anyway, they put names on them. And I can tell by how many people watch what, where they're at spiritually. (laughs) I can tell by what kind of books people buy where they're at spiritually. And I can tell by what kind of, well, we don't sell too many CDs anymore. You get the digital downloads, but you can tell like it is very hard, almost impossible to sell teaching on uh, pride and humility. It's really hard to sell anything on patience. I, I really intend to write a book called Dying to Self, and we're just going to see how that goes. <laughs> How many of you double dare me to write that book, okay? (laughs) It's one of the most important subjects we need to hear about, but sometimes people, not everybody, but sometimes people don't want to hear what they need. They want to hear what makes them feel good. And so I was looking through some of the Instagrams today, and there was one on there called Patience and Perseverance. And 88,000 people watched that. And then we had one called, sit back and do nothing. And 188,000 people watched that. Now, what does that tell you? It's like, (sighs) Donna asked me, what's the biggest thing on your heart? Well, one of the biggest things on my heart is we have got to start walking in love. Because Jesus said that's the only way people are going to know that we're his disciples, if we walk in love. And walking in love involves a lot of things. It involves patience and kindness and generosity, and, and it involves forgiveness. I've been doing this a long time, and I can tell you that about 80% of people in church are mad at somebody. And the Bible tells us plainly that our prayers won't be answered if we don't forgive people. So if you've got unforgiveness in your heart, you might as well just not even pray. Don't even waste your time until that gets settled. 
but it's hard. <laughs> but it's just so hard. Well, I've got a book coming out this fall called Loving People That Are Hard to Love. That one will probably sell. <laughs> um, but I guess the other thing that has always been really important to me is to see all of us, myself included, keep growing up and maturing in Christ and not just go to church and have a bumper sticker and have some Christian jewelry and carry our Bibles, but to really be real Christians and to really love God with our whole heart and to be obedient to him no matter what it costs us and no matter how hard it is. Can anybody say amen? amen. Now, the other scripture that I want us to think about tonight, because I'm going to share some things about this. You know, the Bible talks about the kingdom of God, and we're part of that kingdom. And it's a, the kingdom of God is in you. It's in you, but it's also all of us. And there are spiritual laws that govern that kingdom. One of those spiritual laws is you can't have unforgiveness in your heart and function right in the kingdom of God. But another one is, and I want you to listen because this is gonna have a lot to do with what I'm gonna to share tonight, that you must believe before you receive. Now we're gonna be in a teaching mode tonight. So I want you to go a little bit deeper with me. You must believe before you receive. Well, that's a little challenging because if you believe before you receive, it's a total act of faith because you can't see anything yet, you can't feel anything yet. The only thing you have is God's promise in his word. 7,000 promises in here. So guess what, we can keep reading. We don't know it all yet. Mark 11, 24. 25 says, first it talks about if you have faith, you can say to this mountain, go fall in the sea, and it has to. And then it says, whatever you ask for, believe you have received. It doesn't say believe you will receive. <laughs> says, believe you have received and you will get it. First you believe, then you receive. Now, sadly, it doesn't tell us how long <laughs> of a period of time there is between this believing and receiving. That's where the test of faith comes in. That's where we have to be faithful and Keep doing what we know is right and keep believing that what you've asked God for is on its way and that it will come at the right time in the right way. So this belief that you have received before you get it applies to every aspect of our lives. Like how many of you have something in your life that in you, you personally, that really needs to change that you struggle with and you just can't seem to get beyond it. Okay? The rest of you tired or what? I don't know. <laughs> now I'm about to tell you how to get free. It's very simple. It may sound crazy, but it's Bible and it works. Okay, let's just say that um, you're impatient. So we say all the time, I'm just so impatient. I wish I wasn't so impatient. God help me be patient. Well, we don't really need to pray for patience because patience is already in us. We pray for a lot of stuff we've already got. 
like peace. Oh, God, give me peace. Well, Jesus already said, my peace I leave with you. We have peace. So what we need to say is, God, let me use the peace that's in me. Help me use the patience that's in me. Because the only way that the patience, the love, the joy, the peace, the self-control, all the fruit of the Spirit will develop in your life is through using it. It's like a muscle. I started working out about now, I guess, 15 years ago, and I had muscle, I guess, but you couldn't see it. <laughs> and after I'd been working out about three or four months, I was sitting, we were going for a boat ride one day, and I was sitting on the bow of the boat with my legs propped up, and I scratched the back of my leg, and I felt a lump. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, what's that? I have, a, I have a growth on my leg. And then I felt the other leg and there was one there too. And then I thought, it's muscle. I've actually got muscle. So see, it was in there, <laughs> but it didn't come popping out until I used it. So, Part of the reason why we have these trials and difficulties in our life, and now God doesn't bring our trouble, but he certainly will use them to our benefit when the enemy brings them. So part of the reason why God doesn't move all the bad stuff out of the way right away when we want him to is because it gives us practice. <laughs> You're looking at me so funny. It gives us practice and patience and faith and believing God and not giving up and perseverance and self-control and continuing to walk in love when stuff in our life is a mess. And we have to have that. So really the best thing for you to do when you're having trouble and you're hurting is say, I'm growing. Go ahead, devil, give it your best shot. Help me grow. I'm growing and God is working. Amen? Amen. Try that with me. I'm growing, I'm growing and, God and God is working. The only time we grow spiritually is when we do what's right while it feels wrong. That's worth a write down. I'll say it again. The only time we're growing spiritually is when we do what's right when it feels wrong. If it's easy to do, it's because we've already grown in that area. See? So, now I'm 45 years into my walk with God, so a lot of things are, a lot of doing the right thing is relatively easy for me now. It's not hard for me to forgive people, I just, like that. Because I know that I know that I know that I know that one of the things I cannot do, if I'm going to do what God has called me to do, one of the things I cannot do, absolutely cannot do, is have any kind of unforgiveness in my heart. So, if you want the blessings of God to be poured out in your life, you must not have unforgiveness in your heart. You get before God, if you have to, you get down on the floor, you stretch yourself out, and you say, I am not leaving this room, God, until you give me the grace to forgive. Now, forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a decision that you make about how you're gonna treat somebody who has hurt or offended you. It's not a feeling. You don't even have to like somebody to love them. Some people I have to love at a distance. <laughs> Amen? But we have to love them. God says, love your enemies. And he, I mean, it's described really well in the Amplified Bible. Those who misuse you, abuse you, treat you shamefully, you forgive them and you bless them. Well, I told God, I don't want, to I don't want them to be blessed. 
I mean, let's get real here. I don't want them to be blessed. But then God showed me something. When we pray for God to bless somebody that's hurt us, that doesn't mean they're gonna get a new car and a new house. The first thing God probably will bless them with is some revelation about their behavior. And then the other thing we must do, and to me, these are the one, two, three simple things about love. You forgive no matter how you feel. You bless people, you pray for them, and it's very hard to pray for somebody on a regular basis and still stay mad at them. And here comes the hard part, if they need help, Oh, it makes the devil so mad when you do that. I mean, I bet he needs a lot of some kind of nerve medicine or something on those days. <laughs> the most powerful kind of spiritual warfare you can do is to be good to your enemies. Well, yeah, I'm glad somebody said something. All right, Jesus was son of man and son of God. Fully man, fully God. He was a man born of a woman, but God was his father. So he was a flesh and blood man full of God. Well, guess what? So are we. So when we see Jesus do things that are hard, like when people would accuse him of things and he would just stand there and not even try to defend himself, man, we think that would be hard for me. I would be in your face telling you, if you think you are gonna treat me that way, you have got another thing coming. And then we excuse that by saying, well, that, that's Jesus, of course he can do that. But see, we can too, <laughs> because actually in reality, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us and it will quicken our mortal bodies. But you have to believe it before you will receive it. Okay, let's get back to your weakness and my weakness. So you're impatient and you keep saying, oh, I'm just so impatient. And this is good for me because that's probably still my greatest weakness. I'm not impatient with God. I can wait on God. I, I get all that. I know his timing's right. But Man, if somebody's late for an appointment, <laughs> or last week we were going to a conference in Phoenix and we had an ice storm in St. Louis and the pilot called and said, we got a little problem. They can't get the hangar door open because when they opened it, it got off the track and so we can't get the plane out of the hangar. Well, I want you to know that I had a plan for when I got to Phoenix. And here was my plan. I was gonna eat at this certain restaurant that I like. <laughs> and then there was a little nice woman's dress shop right across the mall there and I was gonna go shop. And then I was gonna go take a little nap. And then I was gonna get up and get prepared some more, I'm, I go prepared, but for my message that night. Well, that little plane thingy messed up my plan. <laughs> now that's when I'm supposed to be patient. Well, you've never had any fun until you're a preacher and your family preaches your messages back to you. So while we're waiting in the airport 
for the people that are going to fix the hangar door to get there. Dave says to me, well, you know, our times are in his hands. <laughs> and then somebody else said, this too will pass. <laughs> and, I'm like, and then somebody else said, all things work together for good to those who love God. <laughs> And I said, shut up. <laughs> right now, I just want to be upset. <laughs> but here is the good news. There is a little bit of good news. Probably the whole thing lasted maybe seven to 10 minutes and then I had a chat with myself got over it and got okay and waited peacefully. Now, years ago, that 10 minutes would have been until I got on the plane and got where I wanted to go and everything worked out the way I wanted it to work out. So I still have an issue with that and I've noticed lately that I've said, you know, I'm impatient, that's my greatest weakness. Well. What I need to do is believe that I'm patient <laughs> while I'm still being impatient. Now, I know this is gonna sound nuts, but just listen. Believe, because I am patient. See, there's two of us. Each one of us live with a crazy person. <laughs> we have a born again spirit that wants to do the right thing and then we've got this crazy flesh that we have to keep dying to. Colossians in the Amplified Bible says kill it. You say, well, how do you do that? You don't feed it. You can kill anything by just not feeding it. Well, we feed the flesh when we give in to it. When we let it have its little fit and go ahead and walk in the spirit, a little bit of it dies. You with me? Okay. When I was trying to learn how to be a submissive wife, which was no easy thing, I'd been abused by men all my life and I had told myself, no man is ever going to tell me what to do. <laughs> well, you better hold that. And then I got in the Bible and found out that a woman is to adapt. Adapt. I didn't even know that word. Adapt to her husband adore him and respect him. Sub I'm a... <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you the truth. When I found out about this not feeding the flesh thing, if I wanted it to die. <sighs> Do you know that you can have real pain in your flesh? I mean, it's not like a physical pain, but it's a, well, maybe it is, you know. But it's just like, you just like, God. And it felt to me like God was always working on me and always showing me what was wrong with me. And I didn't feel like he was ever doing anything with Dave. Anybody got it? Why is it always me? <laughs> it's always me. I'm always the one that's wrong. I'm always the one that has to apologize. It's always me. And so God was dealing with me so hard about something one time and it had to do with something with Dave. I don't know, being nicer to him or being sweeter or something. I don't remember. And uh, 
You know, I thought, well, he's got a few places that he could come up a little higher into. <laughs> and so I actually said to him, is God dealing with you about anything? <laughs> and he, he looked at me and he thought for a minute, and he said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I thought. And then, you know, we say things like, God, this is killing me. And that's exactly what it's doing. It's killing your flesh. And while that's happening, you're supposed to be feeding your spirit with the word of God. Come on. Because whatever you feed the most is going to get the strongest. Good, one person like that. Now, wherever the lady was that liked it when I said I was not going to submit to a man, you... <laughs> well, I've still got a strong personality, and Dave and I chat about things, but, you know, to be honest, we rarely ever argue. We just... I mean, after so many years, you give it up. You just... <laughs> you just say, I'm going to get along with this one. If I get another one, I'll just have to start all over again, so... <laughs> I just... I'm in for the long haul. We're staying together. But now that we both have selective hearing, it's kind of nice. You can only listen to what you want to listen to and say, oh, I didn't hear you. Now, I'll tell you a story. When I first started getting serious with God, I, I, smoked, I still smoked cigarettes. I smoked about, I don't know, 20 years, 25 years, something like that. And um, back then, you know, the three big sins for Christians was drinking, smoking, and cussing. <laughs> that was it. Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about smoking, although I don't, it's not good for you, it's not a good thing to do. but. It says all kinds of stuff about gluttony, but it says nothing about smoking. <laughs> I'll just slide on past that. <laughs> and uh, it does say not to use crude language. And it says not to get drunk with wine.
break my heart No, you can't be fair, you just don't know what I mean This time the monkey green Come on and cheer the wind now Come on and move it, dance on down We're gonna dance all of the Cause we're gonna party till The party and the party vamps Dance with me, baby And jump into my car
But that was the big things, drinking, cussing, smoking. So I really felt like I needed to quit smoking and I had said, everybody say she said. Yeah. I had said for years I could never quit smoking. Well, the more you say something, the more you get yourself convinced that you can't do it. <laughs> the more you say I can't, the more you can't. And the more you say, I can, the more you can. So I had said, I had always been a little bit of a fluffy teenager. That means I was a little bit overweight, a little pudgy. And uh, so I had always said, I know if I quit smoking, I would gain weight. I just know if I quit smoking, I would gain weight. I could never quit smoking. Well, so every time I tried to quit smoking, I couldn't quit. I'd last for maybe a few hours, and then as soon as something put pressure on me, I'd run for the cigarettes. And uh, of course, Dave, he, he just said, well, God, I'm just gonna smoke until you take the desire away, and the next day he got up and never smoked again. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I said to God one time, why are you so strict with me? <laughs> and I know all these other people that are Christians too, and they seem to get to do so many things you won't let me do. <laughs> but he said, look, you've asked me for a lot. Do you want it or not? So see, I can't be up here and be on TV all over the world in a hundred languages and all that sounds so fine to say I'm this, I'm that, blah, 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 blah. but I got to stay on the narrow path and off of the broad path that leads to destruction. So that means to the very best of my ability for where I'm at in my spiritual growth now, I need to submit myself to God so the devil cannot run my life. Amen. So, I really wanted to quit smoking, but I was really having trouble. Well, we were going to uh, what was called a charismatic church then, at the gifts of the Spirit, and we were all excited, and the services back then lasted three, four hours, and so, I, I would go out in the middle of the service, lay down in the car, <laughs> smoke a cigarette. 
I, I don't know what I thought people thought, but they must have thought the car was on fire. Because, I mean, I did that. Well, nobody taught me what I'm teaching you. I had to get all this from God. So just be happy that you're getting just dumped on you what I had to suffer to get. Amen. So, nobody taught me this thing about the power of confession, but God did. And so I started driving down the highway at night on my way home from work, smoking a cigarette, saying, I don't smoke. cigarettes stink. They make me stink. It's a terrible witness, and I don't smoke cigarettes. I hate smoking cigarettes. Do you know within two weeks I had quit? Now, I'm not trying to give you some kind of a little magic charm here, but I am, I am telling you this. If you keep believing I'm addicted to this. I'm addicted to that. I've got a bad temper. I can't keep myself from getting mad. I'm this, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. You're going about it backwards. <laughs> what you need to do is instead of focusing on the wrong things you're doing, focus on the right thing you should be doing. Let me say it again. Instead of meditating on I'm so impatient, I've got a bad temper, all these, this, this, that, that, and something else. Instead of meditating on that, you meditate on the Word of God. What does the Bible say in Joshua 1, 8? Meditate on the Word of God day and night that you may observe and do. As soon as your mind is renewed, and you believe that you are who God says you are and that you can do what God says you can do, then it's all over but the shouting because the next thing that happens is you'll do it. You believe that you receive it and you will get it. What does the Bible say? Be it unto you even as you believe. Okay, do you, do you agree with me or do you think I'm crazy? Okay. So stop saying all these bad things about yourself. Talk about who you are in the spirit. The Bible says in Galatians 5 that the spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh wars against the spirit. And they are continually antagonistic and opposed to one another. So, you and I can want to do something and not want to do it at the same time. <laughs> I work out at home all the time, but it's a lot easier there because I have a trainer, he comes to my house, he sets all the machines, he brings me my weights, he tells me what to do, he puts the weights up. When I go work out down here, I gotta do all that myself. <laughs> and so, sometimes when I'm away from home, I don't work out as often as I do at home. And not yesterday, but day before yesterday, I really knew that I needed to walk, take a walk, about two miles, and I needed to work out. Well. I kept going back and forth. I wanted to work out, I didn't want to work out. I wanted to walk, I didn't want to walk. You ever feel like that? Yes. See, Paul, oh wretched man that I am, what is my problem, the thing I want to do, I can't do, the thing I don't want to do, I do it. What's my problem? <laughs> well, the problem is, is your spirit and your flesh are arguing with each other. but. If you've even got a little tiny bit of spiritual information, you don't have to have counseling to know which one is the right thing to do. Amen. You don't need a prophecy, a special word from God. You don't need to go see your counselor. 
I knew the right thing to do was take the walk, go to the gym. Anytime you do the right thing, then you feel so good after it's done. And a little bit more of your flesh has lost some strength. And so every time you do that, a little bit more of your flesh loses strength and a little bit more of your flesh loses strength. And then pretty soon that thing has no control over you. Amen. You get this? All right. Now, the thing that stirred this message up in me was actually something about Jesus. I don't know. Does what does that mean? Does that mean I've already, I'm already one minute and 18 seconds over my time? <laughs> I have to finish. I, I have to finish. Because you're going you're gonna to see something good. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities. So thank God Jesus understands us because he has been tempted in every way just like we have yet he never sinned. Right, right. So he went through everything that we go through, but yet he never gave into the flesh. He always did his father's will. He's our high priest, and it's wonderful under the new covenant, under the old covenant, the high priest could only go into the Holy of Holies once a year, and he had to go in with blood, and he had to get his sins and the people's sins not forgiven, but covered. So they never lost the sense of feeling guilty because their sin was always there, it was just hidden. But this morning I read <clears throat> Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, again, just to refresh myself. And it's so beautiful because God says, this new covenant that I make with you, I will forgive your sins and I will forget them and I will remember them no more. He doesn't cover them, he annihilates them. <laughs> That's why Romans says there's no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Actually, if you can grab a hold of this, Jesus didn't just take our sin on the cross. The Bible says he became sin. Oh, how awful that must have been for him. For that wonderful, holy thing to become sin. I can't even imagine, can't even imagine. And so when he died, he killed sin. And the Bible says it no longer has any power over us unless we give it power, okay? Stick with me. <clears throat> Now, God would never expect us to do something if he didn't give us the power to do it. How many of you agree with that? That would be silly. It would be silly to say, Joyce, walk in love with your enemies, but I'm not going to give you the ability to do it. So everything the Bible tells us to do or not to do, we can do. But the world has given us so many, everything now is a disease. It's not sin anymore, it's a disease. And that's just a cover up. It kind of gives us an excuse to go ahead and behave that way because now we have a disease, it's no longer sin that we need to repent for. Hmm.
Romans 6, 9, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has any mastery over him. Well, when he died, we died, so death no longer has any control over us. You do not in any way, shape, or form have to be afraid of death because you are not ever going to die. You are going to cease to exist on this planet, but you are an eternal being and you will never die. You will just slip out of this realm into one that is better. To live is Christ, to die is gain. You don't need to be afraid of COVID. You don't, you don't need to live in fear. Amen. <clears throat> okay, now listen. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Now, verse 11 is going to back up what I said to you about believing you're free, and then you'll get it. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. Now, the word count means <clears throat> to think or believe. In the same way, believe that you're dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Therefore, now therefore is there because it refers to what we just read. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body and make you obey its evil desires. So if I'm understanding this right, and I'm not a theologian or a Greek scholar, but I'm not stupid either, and it looks to me like that is saying, I've looked up the word count, and it means to consider yourself, to think, to believe. So if it says count yourself dead to sin, then I need to stop behaving like sin is this huge problem for me and I can't control myself because I'm dead to sin. Now, sin is not dead. It's still gonna try to aggravate the living daylights out of us, but we're dead to it. There's not a person in here, if you're born again, that wants to sin. You do not want to, and you hate it when you do it. And that's because you've got God living on the inside of you. Amen? So count yourself dead to sin, and even if you do sin, when you're right in the middle of it, say, I'm dead to that. Repent, admit you did it, ask God to forgive you. If you need to apologize to somebody, apologize, do all the things you need to do, but still say, I am dead to that and I am not gonna continue doing that. Jesus has set me free. <laughs> oh gosh, can I just have a few more minutes? <clears throat> The thing that brought this message about was, I started thinking about how hard it must have been for Jesus to control himself. Just think about when he was in the wilderness those 40 days and the devil was taunting him. He was fasting and when he was very hungry, the devil said to him, after him fasting for 40 days, if you are the son of God, the devil is always attacking our identity. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Well, if it would have been me, I would have probably whipped up a little snack. <laughs> Maybe not a big one, but a little snack. <clears throat> right away, Jesus said, it is written. We do not still understand how powerful this is. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then th this, went on, this went on three times. I'm not gonna read them all, but I love this one. Jesus took him up, I mean, the devil took him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms in the world and all their splendor. And he said, all this I will give you 
If you will bow down, the Amplified Bible says just once. The just once lie. It's just a little compromise. Just a little bit and everybody else does it. Well, let me ask you a question. If I whipped up a big batch of chocolate chip cookies up here, and I put just the tiniest amount of dog poop in it, <laughs> and I said, do you have a cookie? You, you won't hardly taste it at all because it's just a little bit. There's a, you'd all be smart enough not to eat the cookie. So why are we so dumb? <laughs> I mean, just a little bit. They only take the Lord's name in vain four times in that show. Okay, I won't get started there. You won't like that. Help us, Jesus. One more thing and I'm going to quit. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. My, my, my. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. I guess you want to know where I'm at. Luke 39. Jesus went, as usual, to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. And he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will be done, but yours. An angel came and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood. Now, I've studied that, and that actually can happen, but it only happens when a person is under the most severe stress that you could possibly imagine. So, that's how much he was resisting the temptation not to go to the cross. Let's understand tonight that Jesus went to the cross and died for us, but he did not want to. I think we think he wanted to. He did not want to, but more than he did not want to go to the cross, he wanted to obey his father. So here's what it comes down to. You may want to do the wrong thing, but do you want to obey God more than you want to do the wrong thing? Well, I can't help it. I just got tempted and it's just a weakness for me. Well, I'll come back again next year or something. <laughs> okay, then if you... <laughs> well, you know, when, when the soldiers came in to get him, Peter quickly whips out his sword and cuts off one of the guy's ears. <laughs> he must have been pretty good with a sword to get an ear and not get anything else. <laughs> and Jesus said, no, 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 no. I don't know if he fixed the guy's ear or what, but here's, here's what he said. He said, don't you know that if I wanted to, that I could call for six legions of angels and my father would send them right away. That's 72,000 angels. So he was saying, I don't have to do this. God won't get mad at me if I don't do it, but he's asked me to do it. <laughs> This just blew me away when I saw this. And in Matthew, it says he went twice and asked God to take the cup away. In this book, it says three different times he went and said, Father, if you can take this cup from me, nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. So I guess what I'm asking tonight, well, not I guess, I know what I'm asking. Jesus did a very dangerous thing. He died on the cross, but that's not what I'm talking about. He went to hell, took the keys of hell and death away from Satan, 
That's not what I'm talking about. He rose from the dead, took his blood to the heavenly holy of holies, put it on the mercy seat. He came back. He revealed himself to his disciples and some of the other believers for 40 days. There's nothing that says he revealed himself to any unbeliever. Then he left. Well, that was the most dangerous thing that he could do. You know why? He left it, the job with us. He says, okay, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit, your helper, your strengthener, your intercessor, and you are now my personal representatives making an appeal to the world for me. He left it to us to finish what he started. How dangerous. He just left. <laughs> and he said, I'm coming back, but he didn't say when. So what we have to do, we have a job. And I hope you were not one of the 188,000 who looked at the post that said, sit back and do nothing. <laughs> because that is absolutely 100% not what God wants anybody doing. We all have gifts, we all have talents, we all have abilities, and we need to use them. Come on, give God a prayer. Woo! All right, let me pray for you. Father, I did it the best I could, now it's up to you. Please don't let them forget this message. And help them to think about it and think about it and think about it and study it and get a real revelation for themselves. You left us with a job and you're coming back. And you said you're bringing your rewards with you. God, I want to receive a full reward. And I, no matter how much I don't want to do something you ask me to do, I want to obey you more. So help me always do that and help them do that. And help everybody here tonight to make a greater commitment to be obedient to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this week's service. We pray that God has used this time to really impact your life. Yeah, but it doesn't have to end here. There are actually two ways that you can take this time into the rest of the week. First, you can share. Share in the comments what God spoke to you during this message, and then press the share button and send this to a friend who could use some encouragement. Second, get connected. Whether it's by pressing the subscribe button so that you get notified when new messages go live, or by joining our Facebook group through the link in the description. Our team wants to learn how we can equip you with the right resources and encouragement to live the full life that God has in store for you. Yeah, and finally, you can also be a part of everything we're doing together to share the hope and the message of Jesus Christ by clicking the Give Now link in the description below. See, your financial partnership is gonna allow us to reach even more people around the world for Jesus and help them to step into the full life that they were created for. Absolutely. Thank you again for watching. God bless.